many of you um, probably will have seen other talks and things that I've um, given about diabetes and I decided today that I wasn't going to go over the, the same sorts of material that I've presented at this forum before and in other forums and really focus on um, some things that I think are new and exciting in 2016 um, around diabetes. I'll uh, just start by saying what we'll, we'll cover in the, in the next hour. Just a reminder of the pathogenesis and how it relates to treatment options. Um, what is it that we actually want in a, a new diabetes drug if we're going to get one? Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the new classes of therapy and where they might fit into the scene. Um, that's in cretin-based therapies and SGL2 inhibitors. Um, and then the other thing I want to just cover a little bit about is um, some uh, new technology that we've got uh, coming on stream in terms of glucose monitoring um, devices. Um, so uh, you will have seen these sorts of figures and I've shown them before. Uh, this is a, a slide of the diabetes prevalence in New Zealand and it's taken from the virtual diabetes register. And I know many of you in um, uh, primary care feel that the virtual diabetes register has its problems and doesn't always necessarily totally reflect your practice and I think that's absolutely accepted but it's the best we've got uh, and it's a pretty good way actually of us being able to maintain track of what's happening in diabetes in New Zealand. And so what, what you see on this slide here is age groups across the bottom and prevalence rates up the side uh, for the adult uh, or for the population uh, across the age groups there and it's broken down by ethnicity. Uh, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see some of the issues we have in New Zealand here. So obviously, as one would expect, the rates of diabetes increase with age. That's very obvious. Uh, but what's incredibly striking about this is the differences between ethnicities in New Zealand. And I think if, I, if I'd asked you before, not necessarily this audience, but I've asked most people without showing this, uh, which groups in New Zealand, which ethnic groups had the highest rates of diabetes, I think most people would probably say Pacific, uh, but probably people would also say Māori were right up there with Pacific and many wouldn't necessarily realise, as you can see from this graph, that actually the Indian um, population have extremely high rates of diabetes and in fact parallel that uh, of the Pacific population uh, with, with European um, down here. Um, just again to remind you as a, a prelude to the discussion about the pharmaceuticals, is the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes and I'm focusing on type 2 because that's 90 plus percent of the diabetes that uh, we manage and particularly that's managed in primary care. And uh, just to remember that um, the, the risk factors for developing type 2 diabetes, um, genes, uh, family history is actually more uh, of a risk factor for type 2 than it is in type 1 and that's often not uh, appreciated. Uh, but of course lifestyle, sedentary lifestyle and obesity are, are the prime modifiable risk factors uh, for diabetes. And the pathogenesis is twofold. It's uh, a combination of problems between both insulin resistance and beta cell uh, function. So what obesity and sedentary lifestyle primarily drive is resistance to the action of insulin. And early in the piece, uh, individuals are able to overcome that resistance by simply increasing pancreatic insulin production. Uh, but it's when the pancreas begins to give up the ghost uh, that blood sugars um, increase. And you see that on this slide here. So going across from the bottom through, uh, you can see the earliest things that uh, happen is that insulin resistance increases and then you begin to get a rise in post-prandial, post-meal glucose levels. Uh, but then once the pancreas down the bottom here where the insulin secretion begins to taper off, uh, that's when fasting glucose also increases and uh, the diagnosis of diabetes is made. So it's a twofold problem, both beta cell function and insulin resistance. Uh, the other bit of background information just to remember is that this is, and you can see it from the previous slide of course, but, but diabetes, type 2 diabetes is a progressive condition over time. Uh, and this slide you will have seen is from the UK PDS study, so the gold standard um, uh, landmark study in type 2 diabetes uh, where individuals at the time of diagnosis were randomised to intensive or non-intensive um, control. Now the point of showing this slide is not the difference between the intensive and the conventional group uh, because that's you know, common knowledge and underpins our treatment, but the point of the slide is in the conventional group, uh, you see this progressive rise in HbA1c over the 15 years duration um, of that study. Uh, and that's telling us that type 2 diabetes progresses. And it progresses primarily because the beta cells continue to peter out over time. Uh, 
The importance of that, I think, is that at the time of diagnosis, when you have a person early, particularly when they're diagnosed at a young age, uh, they need to know this is going to happen. Uh, and that means that it's highly likely that at some point in their career with diabetes, they are going to need insulin therapy. And it's important to tell them that early on so that it's not a, a threat, it's not a they have failed when they reach the point where they need insulin therapy, it's just that it's going to happen, that's what the disease does. There are of course a lot of things they can do before that point to delay that as long as possible but it's almost an inevitability for most people, particularly if they're diagnosed early with type 2 diabetes. All right, so let's make some assumptions based on the data we know, and I could you know, present you all the data to support this, but let's, let's make these assumptions, if, if I may, for the purpose of today. So obesity is bad, uh, but diabetes is actually worse. Tight glycemic control, plenty of evidence to show that tight glycemic control is a good thing, improves outcomes, reduces um, risk for microvascular disease, and as I put down the bottom here, uh, unequivocally reduces the risk for microvascular disease. Um, the, the ability to reduce macrovascular disease has been a little bit um, debatable, uh, but I think we've got accumulating evidence that, that is the case, and I'm going to show you some data today that uh, perhaps makes that a little bit more convincing. Um, but we also know that diabetes control that's too tight can actually be harmful. And you'll recall the ACCORD study, which is the, the, the main study that's really shown this, is that if we, achieve for, uh, if we aim for too tight uh, glycemic control, and uh, we can actually increase uh, sudden death, and it's thought that may be, and it's highly controversial, but it may be driven by increased rates of hypoglycemia. So hypoglycemia is bad if we're trying to achieve too tight glycemic control. So if you would accept those assumptions for the rest of the talk, that'd be great. We can argue and debate them uh, at any time if you like. So if we are um, wanting to think about the person in front of us and what treatment we want to offer them to try and improve their outcomes, these are the sorts of factors that we need to take into account. Efficacy. If we're going to put someone on a drug, we want it to have a decent uh, effect on their HbA1c. There's no point in mucking around with you know, tiny effects. We want a, reason, a, you know, a decent effect. We want that effect to be sustained. There's no point in putting, on, putting someone on something or doing something that's only going to have a six months effect. We want, we want a long-term effect. Ideally, because of the knowledge that beta cell function progressively declines over time, ideally we want to try and put them on something that might preserve that beta cell function for as long as possible. And because we know that weight and obesity are such a driver, we'd ideally like an agent which is going to uh, help with weight loss, certainly not hinder it, uh, help with weight loss. Nobody likes taking things that have side effects, and every drug has a side effect. I'm sure you know, we all tell our patients this. Um, so we want something that's going to be easy to take. We want something that doesn't cause hypoglycemia. And as I've said, what, what doesn't cause weight gain. And the other thing which um, I think we need to remember with diabetes, microvascular complications are not good. You know, going blind isn't great. Having your kidneys fail isn't great. But we can, we can do things about that. But people with type 2 diabetes, or with, even with type 1 diabetes, what they die from prematurely is cardiovascular disease. So actually, if we're going to treat people, we want to treat them with something that's going to reduce their cardiovascular risk. And of course, from the country point of view, from New Zealand Inc. point of view, we want the cheapest possible. Uh, so not a lot to ask, really, is it, uh, if uh, we want all these things. All right, now let's... Um, just think about where we sit currently with our approach to managing diabetes. So focusing on glycemic control, uh, we want to target an HbA1c somewhere between 48 and 58 millimoles per mole. And I think most people would say 53 to 55 is kind of where we aim for for most people. Of course, it's individualised depending on the person's circumstance, but that's a rough rule of thumb. Diet and lifestyle. Uh, is the, you know, the, the cornerstone of, of management, and that's a whole talk on its own. Um, and then we go to oral agents, and unequivocally metformin is our first-line oral agent. I don't think there's any question or doubt or debate about that. Uh, and then we start getting into combination therapies and eventually insulin. So that's, that's the pathway that you're all very familiar with. After metformin, what are we currently using? 
So historically, we've used dolphin ovaries. We've used them since you know, the mid, mid last century. We know about them, we know what they do. Uh, there's plenty of good evidence they have glucose lowering um, agents, uh, glucose lowering effect. But they do contribute to weight gain and they do uh, certainly in elderly cause hypoglycemia. So they're not the, you know, they're an okay drug, they're certainly cheap and effective. Glitazones um, came heralded with uh, a lot of promise um, in terms of their uh, glucose lowering effect but also potentially other benefits they might have had but they haven't really delivered on that and increasingly we keep seeing more and more side effects from them. Uh, weight gain, heart failure certainly one that worries us um, and, and fractures is, uh, is another thing that's sort of crept in there. So glitazones, that's pyoglitazone, uh, we can still use it but uh, really going out of favour really because of the side effect profile. Acabose, um, that's been around for a long time um, can be reasonably effective, particularly early in the piece, um, and effective in people who have a high carbohydrate diet, um, but troubled with side effects. Um, a lot of people don't particularly like the side effects, and their partners like them even less. Um, and actually, the glucose lowering effect of it's pretty marginal. We're talking about sort of five millimoles uh, per mole of um, HbA1c at most. So. These are the agents we're familiar with and we've had for a, a long time. So what we need in our new treatments, if we're going to accept them and if we're going to fund them, is we need the treatments to have additive benefit over and above our traditional medicines. Okay? We need to be able to use them when there are existing complications. So we don't want to have to stop them if someone has heart failure. We don't want to have to stop them if someone's renal function begins to decline. They've got to be acceptable to patients. And there's no point in having a, a wonderful drug if the patients aren't going to take them. We know what adherence is like to many medications and how many drugs people with diabetes have to take. So it's got to be something easy and simple, ideally once a day and ideally oral. That's what we'd really like. Um, We've got to have evidence that they reduce the risk of the complications and, and don't actually make things worse. And as I've said, particularly we want something that's going to reduce cardiovascular events because that's what kills people. Preferably not increase weight and ideally not cause hypoglycemia. So again, we're not asking a lot, are we, from the uh, uh, pharmaceutical industry to try and come up with something like this. So if we're going to develop and target drugs for diabetes, where might we think about targeting things? Well, this, this just shows you the, the sites where we potentially could have some therapeutic effect. Um, and so obviously the pancreas is, is where insulin is uh, made from and released. So anything that might uh, potentially increase the beta cell function uh, would be great. Uh, insulin resistance on the other side of the equation affects the liver and, and causes increased glucose release from the glivus, uh, liver. So anything that might target that would be good. Uh, muscle and fat insulin resistance, anything that works there would be great and anything that could work in the gut to perhaps alter the absorption of carbohydrate or the handling of carbohydrate uh, would be good choices as well. So those are some of the drugs that we've already got. Uh, these are some of the newer ones which I'm going to talk about today and then the other new player on the, on the scene is um, drugs that work in the, in the kidney uh, as a source of altering glucose um, metabolism or glucose levels. So uh, here we have the same slide as before, but with these new agents, DPP4 antagonists, GLP1 agonists, and SGL2 inhibitors added into it. And those are what I'm going to talk about now. I'll just go through that quickly. Right. So in cretin-based therapies, um, in cretin, the, the incretin effect is essentially the added effect you get from having glucose taken by mouth versus the same amount of glucose injected intravenous, intravenously on insulin release. All right, so I'll show you that just uh, graphically. So that's what happens. Um, we've got healthy, con healthy controls on the uh, left-hand side and people with type 2 diabetes on the right-hand side. And here you've given them uh, a glucose load intravenously. And you can see that the healthy controls start off with a slightly lower glucose level and it doesn't rise quite as much um, following the injection of the glucose. And down the bottom panels here, you've got the insulin response. So in the uh, people with uh, uh, the normal controls, you get a reasonably rapid insulin response that comes down quickly. 
in people with type 2 diabetes, the insulin response is slower. Uh, actually might be a little bit higher overall, but it's a slower response uh, to that glucose load. Now what happens if you give the same amount of glucose as an oral um, uh, preparation? What you see there is that in healthy controls, the um, glucose uh, level is pretty much mirrors that in the, um, uh, from the intravenous load as it does in people with type 2 diabetes. But look down the bottom there at the insulin response. What you see is that in uh, healthy controls, you get this significantly greater insulin response uh, to an oral glucose load than you get to uh, an intravenous glucose load. And the same thing happens with type, people with type 2 diabetes, but what you'll notice there is that de the degree of that added benefit is blunted. All right? So this is the incretin effect. The extra insulin release you get from an oral glucose load, uh, and in people with diabetes that effect is blunted. Okay, so that whole incretin effect is mediated by a hormone which is released from our lower small intestine uh, called GLP-1 or glucagon-like peptide 1. And that has been the target of uh, drug development for agents for diabetes. So this is how incretins uh, work. So we eat food, uh, goes into the gut and is absorbed and the release of um, the, the presence of food going through the small intestine releases glucagon-like peptide 1 as well as another hormone called GIP but GLP-1 is the, the most important uh, of these and that hormone stimulates the release of insulin from the pancreas and the effect, um, well it does two things, <laughs> sorry, uh, it, it both stimulates insulin release which I'll show you in a second but it also inhibits glucagon release and you'll remember that glucagon and insulin are counter um, hormones here. So it's effectively uh, having a double effect on glucose metabolism by inhibiting glucagon and increasing insulin release. And the effect of that is to reduce the amount of glucose released from the liver, but also to improve the uptake of glucose in skeletal muscle. Now GLP-1 is rapidly broken down after it's released. Um, and it's broken down by a hormone called DPP-4. Uh, to an inactive form that uh, doesn't do anything. All right. So if you're thinking, well, what could we possibly do to harness this incretin effect uh, in terms of glucose metabolism developing a drug, then it's obvious that the two things you could either do is that you could inhibit the enzyme that breaks down the naturally formed GLP-1, or you could give a drug which was similar or mimicked GLP-1 that wasn't broken down by that enzyme. And that's of course what the pharmaceutical age, uh, companies have, have done. Right, so just a little bit more about that though. So GLP-1 is, is not just a stimulator of the pancreas. It also does some other good things which are useful in type 2 diabetes as well. Uh, so as well as um, having an effect on the... On the um, uh, beta cells in the pancreas. Uh, it also uh, reduces the glucagon as we've seen, um, but it, uh, here we go, sorry, it also feeds back to the stomach and it slows down the rate of emptying of food from the stomach. So obviously if you've got a whole lot of food going through quickly and the pancreas and the body is challenged by a big glucose load, it's harder to process that. If you can slow down the gastric emptying, uh, then you're giving the, essentially I, I sort of think you're giving the pancreas a better chance uh, to actually process it. But it doesn't stop there. This is where you get some steak knives as well. Uh, it also feeds back to the hypothalamus and promotes satiety. So you also feel full more quickly and are less inclined to overeat. So it's pretty obvious really the benefits of uh, enhancing this incretin hormone GLP-1. You've got direct effects on the pancreas, you've also got effects on the stomach, and you've got effects on satiety, uh, which hopefully are going to lead to benefits in terms of weight as well. So <coughs> the... Um, there have been a, a, two classes of agents which have been developed. And the first of those are the DPP-4 inhibitors. So drugs which are targeting that enzyme to increase the action and effect of the existing GLP-1 that people are still making. Uh, 
And this is just one trial uh, to show you the, the evidence base, or some of the evidence base for these drugs. And I use this one because this was actually a trial that we took part in in Wellington uh, here. So any of you from Wellington, some of your patients may have even been in this. This is about 10 years old, this uh, um, study now. Uh, and this was a study where people were either randomised to metformin or to citagliptin, which is one of the DP4 inhibitors, uh, or a combination of the two. And uh, what you can see there is that either met, uh, citagliptin and metformin are effective in lowering glucose alone, but they also have a synergistic effect. Uh, and the other thing to notice is that those who started off with a higher baseline HbA1c had a greater reduction. Now, to a degree, this is a regression to the mean phenomenon. You'll see that in any trial. Um, but it does show you that you can get up to 2.9% uh, reduction in HbA1c uh, if you start off with a fairly high level. So that, in our current terms, is about uh, 30 millimoles per mole reduction. So pretty impressive if you're starting off with a really high um, level. So we were pretty excited about this class of drugs. I'm not saying that I'm not excited about them now, but um, certainly some of the initial data looked uh, really promising. This is a study, um, this is a, a meta-analysis, uh, and what it's doing is showing you all of these studies, or not all, but many of the studies, um, which have looked at DPP4 in, uh, inhibitors um, against placebo uh, in, in the trials like the one I've just shown you. And just so that you um, familiarise yourself here, this is zero here, which means that there's no difference between the placebo and the DPP4 inhibitor in terms of glucose um, lowering. If it's on this to the left hand side of this line then there's benefit of the DPP4 over the placebo and if it's on the right hand side of the line the placebo was better. All right? So obviously what we're wanting to see in a drug is that it's on the left uh, and this is the degree of uh, difference in HbA1c and what you see here if you pull all of them together is uh, most of the studies have, have benefit, there's one or two that didn't, but overall the uh, effect of DPP4s is to reduce HbO1c between about 0.5 and 1%, so that's 5 to 10 millimoles per mole. Right? So that's not insignificant, but you'd have to say you'd like a bit more than that, wouldn't you, really, in terms of glucose lowering. This is, of course, mean data of multiple studies and doesn't tell you necessarily about the effect you're going to see in the individual sitting in front of you, but it gives you a bit of a ballpark. All right. So overall, DPP4 antagonists, um, the benefits, uh, because of the action, the way they work, they don't cause hypoglycemia, uh, and they're weight neutral, which is great. Uh, negatives, um, nausea, nasopharyngitis, there's a small group of people who get this very unusual reaction to DPP4 inhibitors um, where they get, the, get it, it's like a, um, a constant cold that doesn't go away. And if they get it, you just have to take them off the drug because uh, it doesn't, doesn't go away. It's a very small proportion. We saw one or two in the, in the study. I've never actually had somebody subsequent to that who's had it, but, but it does occur. Nausea actually doesn't seem to be a big issue. This is a very well tolerated class of drugs, I have to say, uh, compared to many other drugs that we use. But I think the main limiting thing for it is that it actually has a relatively small glucose um, reduction in the HbO1c. Have had individuals where I've used it and had really good effects. So I think, you know, for some people it's a great drug, uh, but certainly not something you're going to use across the whole population by any stretch of the imagination. Right, now the next um, class of drugs that I want to talk about are the GLP-1 agonists. So these are drugs that um, essentially mimic the GLP-1 hormone. And the first one of these to be developed and described was, is exenatide, and that's the one we have access to in New Zealand. Um, and for some bizarre reason, somebody found that uh, uh, there was the stuff in the spit of the Gila monster uh, that looked very similar to human GLP-1. Don't ask me why someone was looking in the spit of a Gila monster, but they found it. So, um, exenatide, uh, the reason it, it can be used is that it's got a structure which is very similar to GLP-1, but the particular part of the protein where the DPP-4 acts is different, so it's resistant to the action of that, uh, uh, that enzyme. Uh, but the active binding site to the GLP-1 receptor is preserved. Um, so again, same sort of uh, slide as the one previously that I showed you for the DPP-4 inhibitors. This is a summary of, um, a, of the trials which have looked at the um, 
effect of the GLP-1 agonist class of drugs. And what you can see here is that actually against placebo, uh, the um, GLP-1 agonists have a slightly greater, about a 1% or about a 10, 11 uh, millimole per mole reduction in HbA1c on average. So more potent effect than the DPP-4 in in inhibitors.